Okay, hi. Today, <clears throat> I wanna talk about a part of philosophy that um, I wanna talk about the metaphysics of modality, the metaphysical implications of modal logic. Now that sounds very technical and like that might be something difficult to understand, but that's exactly why we're here because my goal and uh, what I'm doing here in this little video is really to try and put the issues here across in a way that you can understand even if you really haven't studied any of this before and even if certainly you're not someone who's going to go on thinking more about modal logic or metaphysics or anything like that. In fact, that's very much my purpose is to try and put this in as simple terms as possible. So um, in terms of what I'm trying to achieve, that's part of my goal, a really basic introduction to the metaphysics of modality. Modality also, by the way, can mean a lot of different things. It's a fairly complicated topic, but we're going to, a, a concept, but we're going to make it simple here. We're talking about philosophical issues that come around with our concepts of um, <clears throat> necessity, contingency, possibility, impossibility, and probability. And our use of terms like that raise questions in philosophy, traditionally have raised questions in philosophy. And there's been some very interesting philosophy along the uh, latter part of the 20th century uh, during this sort of revival of metaphysics that we have in the Anglophone philosophical community that's really quite interesting and, and diverting. It's, so I wanna share that with you today because as always with these videos, you know, I'm showing you things not because we need to take our medicine, but rather because we're here trying to have some fun and see some beautiful things about uh, this rich world that we have. So let's get on with that then. I will, I have my little, uh, my little thing there. This up, I never did learn how to do this in a non-clunky way. <clears throat> So there is such a thing. So what am I going to do here? I'm going to explain um, uh, possible worlds modal logic. It's a modern uh, version of modal logic. I'm going to walk you into that historically fairly slowly. As you see from the little diagram here on the title slide, one of the things we're talking about <clears throat> is this sense of <clears throat> a kind of tree diagram of choices and directions that we could go. Of course, modality, as I will show you now, has to do more than uh, just with probability and our freedom to make decisions, although it's related to that. So the classical problem of probability itself, here I, here I am at the, uh, at the casino in my town, Mayaguez, uh, counting cards at the blackjack counter. I always come down here uh, when the social security checks come out, if you know what I mean, and uh, see how, what I can do. And uh, so say I'm counting the cards. I probably won't explain how you do that because apparently you're not supposed to do that. And uh, and and I know for sure, I, if I'm good at it, I might even get to some more specific thing, like 40% chance that the next card the dealer turns over is going to be too big to keep me in because I've already got, say, 16 showing or something like that. It doesn't matter if you know about blackjack or not. Uh, the point is that I'm trying to figure out my odds about what the next card that's turned over are going to be. And so then look at that second bullet point on our slide here. Uh, you know, because in reality, reality, actuality, the fact is that the dealer has a particular card in the deck. I mean, the card just is what it is. There's no, it's not vague. It's not possible. It's not like Schrodinger's cat or something. It's just the card that it really is. And uh, so in fact, then it looks as if in, again, in, in terms of our discussion of the sort of material state of affairs, there really isn't any probability there at all. The only place where the probability exists there is in my mind. That is, I'm just a finite being. The best that I can do is just sort of try to count the cards. As far as I know, there's something less than there's something less than 100% chance of this kind of card being turned over. But uh, but in reality, there's no chance at all. So traditionally, you know, a question is, well, is there is, is at last point, you know, on the slide, is there any uh, anything like probability at all? And of course, that's also going to going to relate to our notions of our own ability to make choices. So probability is a problem, but we want to talk about a, another issue here called modality. It can be 
Uh, well, no, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure it is that hard to understand. Uh, I'll go, but I'll go through this slide slowly. The problem of probability is essentially about determinism. Is it true that there are various ways things could go next? Is it true that things might it might happen this way or it might happen that way? Uh, and and among those things, it, thing, ways things might go, it might be that I decide to do this or I might decide to do that. I have to go down to the post office later. Or supposedly, when I go down to the post office, I'll make various decisions. Am I going to go to the supermarket first or the post office second? Where am I going to park in the post office? And so on. So it looks as if I'm just going around making all of these decisions. But as we just saw in the blackjack case, it, it looks as if we don't really have super great uh, metaphysical foundations for thinking that we really are making those decisions. So the problem of modality is more general. The problem of modality is about ways things could have been, ways things can be. Um, and notice that goes beyond laws of nature, that goes beyond physical necessity. We, we sometimes think, well, things are necessary because they're physically necessary, by which we mean that according to the physical laws in our world, in this universe, this is possible, that's impossible. Modality is a broader notion than that. And so, for example, a universe could have had different causal laws than the ones that, that we have. And well, how different? And, and is there a limit on that? And can we think about that? Actually, thinking about these things is uh, uh, of a lot of use sometimes. Um, so again, second bullet point, we can coherently ask, well, what if what what um, what if the physical laws and constants of this universe were different? How different could they be? And that's a modal question. As you know, a modal question is, oh, I could have been a contender, right? I could have been a contender. That's a modal claim. It is, it is possible, but we can also uh, ask questions about the way things could have been just in general. I could have been born somewhere else. I could have been my parents. Maybe maybe my parents were missionaries in. Korea, say, and I was born there, and for some reason we didn't speak English, and so I just grew up speaking Korean all the time. But I'd still be me. But if I didn't have parents, would I still be me? It looks like I couldn't be uh, a lamp and still be me. Could I be a cow and still be me? Uh, and so again, these are those are also modal questions, and we'll see that modality, this this modern discussion of the metaphysics of modality, among other things opens up into a fairly interesting discussion about the nature of personal identity. So we'll get to that as well. Okay, so modality is, again, just this question is, is the way things are necessary, contingent, um, and, uh, and, how, and, and how could things have been? One of the first philosophers in the Western tradition to notice this question, problems with modality, was Parmenides. Parmenides, a big influence on Plato. Plato sort of stuck between this, what he saw as this kind of eternal fluxing and changing world that Heraclitus described and this thought of Parmenides that I'm explaining here on this slide. Parmenides was thinking about the concept of existence and he makes the point, which is maybe subtle because it's abstract, but, but here, here it is that existence is a positive thing by definition. When you say that something exists, you're saying a positive thing. And, and so Parmenides thought that in the same way that probability might just be something that's a product of our own finitude, our sense of probability might not be real. It might just be a reflection of our own limitations. And Parmenides thought also that human beings perceiving negativity and using negative language, this thing's not that thing. That's not true. There isn't this here. Uh, he thought that also was uh, just a reflection of human nature and the human mind, because in reality, again, Parmenides thought everything that exists just exists. To exist is a positive thing, that it exists. There isn't anything negative about anything that exists. And Parmenides, who, like all ancient Greek philosophers, mixes the physical claim with the logical claim in a way that in modern times we have much better sorted out, although this is one of the things that's kind of charming and interesting about ancient Greek philosophy. And so Parmenides thinks that, well, you know, so you see, if you say X is not Z, then, you know, that also is strictly speaking, can't really be true because X doesn't have any negative properties at all. It's just an existing thing. 
So not being some other thing than Parmenides and, and claims like that, Parmenides includes in the sort of illusory uh, human descriptions of things. And Parmenides concluded, since he didn't think that anything could not be something else and that there wasn't really any negative in the world, that, that last bullet point, that, that reality is actually a kind of undifferentiated, unchanging, unlocatable, indescribable, indivisible, I sort of think of it like a giant black bowling ball in black space somewhere, but even that's not good because that would have a surface and that could be divided into this part of the surface and that part of the surface. And Parmenides denies that there can possibly be anything like that because that one part of the surface and wouldn't be like the other part of the surface. As, as a side note, as we pass along, notice that this notion that fundamental metaphysics has to do with the oneness of the world is also very uh, prevalent in Asian philosophy. I'll just, I'll just put that down because Parmenides is one of these axial age thinkers who is getting ideas from these, but that's, that's off the topic here. Um, what's, what's interesting as uh, students of philosophy about Parmenides is that uh, then this argument notice is a kind of purely logical argument. It's what philosophers call a priori before the fact. Parmenides says, look, just sitting in his armchair reasoning, he says, look, existence is a positive thing. All of these negative claims, this, this negative function in the language is just that. It's just a function of the language. It doesn't reflect anything that's real about the world. So with Parmenides, we got one of the first philosophers uh, who is using just logical principles and coming up with real conclusions about the world. And that's something that's interesting about Parmenides. But Parmenides is, is noticing this question about modality. In the 1600s, you get a lot of discussion about this because that's a transitional period, uh, the 1600s, the 17th century. It's a time of the so-called scientific revolution. And the thinkers, it's, it, to, to talk about the philosophers of, of these periods until we get to the modern time is a little bit misleading because these are just intellectuals and thinkers who do lots of different things. Um, but they are wondering uh, a perfectly good thing to wonder about and something that modern physicists are all about, which is a kind of relationship. What is the relationship between mathematics and the physical world? You know, we, now we have a very much a, a sort of mathematical model of the physical world. Theoretical physics and mathematics are almost sort of very much related. So two, two very close things. So, um, so Descartes, the rationalist says, look, uh, God, this is coming out of this classical tradition of Plato, God is uh, rational. God is clear and distinct ideas, the source of our clear and distinct ideas. And so uh, God is, is uh, consummately rational and logical. That's the rationalist ethos, right, and aesthetic. Um, so, so Spinoza is thinking about this a wonderful philosopher. And Spinoza sort of reasons like this. Spinoza thinks, look, God is infinite. Um, and Spinoza also uses the term mode, by the way, in a technical sense that it's very interesting. But in any event, Spinoza says, God is infinite. And, and if God is truly infinite, then that means that there can't be any boundaries. There can't be any place. We have God on one side and non-God on the other. There can't be any non-God anywhere because of the infinite nature of God. And again, thinking about how we're going to get our sort of platonic understanding of mathematics integrated with our new empirical, physical, natural science. Uh, and so uh, Spinoza says this, he says, God is nature. The universe is God. The universe is both the mind and body of God. The looking at the mind and the body are two different ways of looking at the same thing. You call that double aspect theory. Spinoza is also significant still today in philosophy of mind because of this idea that he has. There's a way of, uh, that everything will come under both a physical description and a psychological description. Uh, so Spinoza ontologically, remember thinking about the metaphysics of modality here. And so Spinoza says, look, uh, as far as what exists, as far as what my ontology is, he's a monist, that is he only has one element in his, in his ontology. Like a materialist says only matter exists, for example. And Spinoza says only God exists. Everything is God. And Spinoza had, you know, the idea that maybe we could make the study of nature and physical nature into a kind of sacramental activity. I mean, he's, he was very enlightened, but too way, way, way too far ahead of his time, too far too ahead of our time, I would say. 
um, just getting to Spinoza's kind of thinking now, I would say. So, um, so that struck people as outrageous. But what we want to see is, is this. Uh, he thinks that everything is God. But then look at the third bullet point on the slide. God, as Descartes also has this issue, God is logically perfect and complete. Uh, and so that means, look, if the, if the world that we live in is both the mind and the body of God, which are the same thing, and the mind of God is perfect rationality, think of all the entailments of mathematics, most of which we've never proved or noticed, but think of them all uh, as a giant kind of uh, entity. And so, so Spinoza thinks, look, uh, it looks to us finite human beings as if things are contingent, as if that tree there maybe could have been over there or, or other things could have been different than the way that they are. But that's only a function of our limitations. If we had this kind of omniscient knowledge that God has, we would see that everything is uh, necessary, that this is a logically necessary world that follows from Spinoza's thesis that God is everything. Leibniz, uh, who also anticipates uh, um, possible worlds modal logic and computation. Leibniz is an extremely brilliant person, uh, sees that uh, Spinoza's God is not an intentional God. It is not a God that makes decisions because Spinoza's God is pure rationality, complete logic. And so um, that means that there are no choices to be made. Everything just is what it is. Everything just resides in a state of necessary perfection. But the problem with that, that Leibniz saw, was that then God can't be a moral being. To be a moral being, you have to be an intentional being, a being that makes decisions because it has reasons. Uh, that's where the possibility of morality exists. I could do this or I could do that. I could have done otherwise, but I did what I did. That's what makes me a moral being, a potential moral being. Plato thinks this also. Plato in the Timaeus argues that the universe must be a person, not just a mind, but an intentional person making decisions because Plato thinks that the universe is a moral place and, and, the, and, and agrees with Leibniz that the only way to be moral is to be a, a choosing, uh, deliberating being. That's where the possibility of morality lives. So, so Leibniz said, no, God performed a moral act God chose the best of all possible worlds. This is the best of all possible worlds. That's the thesis that Voltaire is making fun of in Candide, his Enlightenment novel from the next century, from the 18th century. So, um, so uh, this gets to the problem of evil in a way that's, uh, well, I'm, I, look, here's the deal. Yeah, earthquakes are bad. You know, uh, mediocre television is a drag. But earthquakes and mediocre television are the price for all the good things, for love and strawberries and all the good things in the world. So uh, the argument is that it addresses the problem of evil, right? Well, God gave us the best possible world. And so, because God is good, but even the most benevolent God can't do any better than give us the, own, the best, the only possible world. Implicit in that notice, is the idea that God is limited by logical necessity of some sort. And again, logical and physical necessity all blended together here. So, all right. Um, so you see they're having this argument about ways things could be, about the way that the world could be. All through this little sort of potted history of this, notice that they don't come to conclusions. And that's part of what's interesting about the topic. Hume, the great empiricist, thought that metaphysics in general was, um, was over and done with because he believed that anything that was speculative, that is to say not based on direct observation, just had no purchase as a claim to knowledge. And furthermore, Descartes, uh, epistemologically, in terms of his theory of knowledge, Descartes wanted to say, you know, true knowledge is when you've proven that something is logically necessary. And of course, that's what generates all of Descartes' skepticism, his skepticism about the external world and his own body and everything else, all flows from this epistemological view that he has that to know something is really to be in possession of a proof of the logical necessity of the thing. 
And what Hume does, I mean, one way of reading Hume is, is as a systematic refutation of Descartes because Hume is just going along saying, well, for anything that you, you say that we know about, we demonstrably don't know it by virtue of a proof of the logical necessity. Uh, prominently things like that the sun will rise in the east tomorrow or, or that the sun will the sun will rise in the east tomorrow or, this, or that the sun will rise at all um, and so on. And this, of course, people read Hume as a skeptic, but that's incorrect. Hume is, Hume, is a refu Hume is offering us a refutation of skepticism because what Hume says is, look, uh, proof of logical certainty is just not the way we use the word the verb to know, <laughs> knowing things just doesn't involve that. And, and so uh, he's going around showing that we don't know things by logical necessity. But that's not saying that we don't know things according to him. But Hume uh, does, as I say, he sort of ultimate empiricist takes it out about as far as it'll go. Uh, and he says, well, you know, Hume is maybe the first sort of avowed atheist on principles in the tradition. He says, look, uh, if, you, if you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, taste it, hear it, it's not there. And, uh, but also things like freedom in the sense you have freedom to make, if freedom is some sort of metaphysical thing, or if the mind is something beyond the contents of the mind, or that, uh, right, or that there are um, inherent values in the world. He, 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 he suspected that was false, uh, that there's a causal force beyond just the bare fact of, uh, of the constant conjunction of cause and effect, and so on. So that's sort of his method. So obviously, he's going to be very unsympathetic to the idea that there are different ways that things could be, or there are different ways things might have been, because he doesn't see any evidence for that. Um, okay. Then uh, Kant comes along and Kant's very alarmed by Hume because Hume says that Hume gives us the vision of the modern scientific world. Hume says, look, this world doesn't have God or freedom or minds or souls or, or morality or value. Uh, this world isn't like that. And this, this alarmed Kant no end. Kant's idea was to sort of um, uh, contain Hume's empirical world. And the way that he did that was psychological. That is, Kant says, look, all of these things is the third bullet point are, um, are projections of the mind. The, the human mind has to make sense of the, of the uh, stimuli coming in. And so the human mind projects onto the world. Notice people forget about this, about Kant, he's really radical. The human mind projects onto the world uh, cause and effect relations, uh, space and time aren't actually part of, of the noumenal world, the real world, they're part of the phenomenal world, the world of experience, um, uh, probability, all the rest of it are all um, products of the mind, projections of the mind. So notice at the end of human Kant, coming out of the early modern period, we're still in just terrible shape here. I mean, we've got no, uh, we've got no purchase on uh, an explanation of modality whatsoever coming into, um, coming into the 19th century. In the 19th century, you get at the end of the 19th century, uh, you have people earlier like John Stuart Mill still taking classical empiricist uh, wax at mathematics, at the met metaphysics of mathematics. But, um, but you get a different take later with, uh, with the development of what now you, you get loosely referred to as set theory. Um, originally, it means something more specific than that. Uh, second bullet point that the goal then is to show the human practice of mathematics involves us in no non-physical platonic objects, no mathematical objects. Uh, numbers and equations aren't things that are real over and above physical objects. That's the aim. That's the goal to show that that's true. So you have nominalism. Nominalism from nom, nombre, the name, uh, a medieval view an old view, um, but it came back to prominence in modern times. The idea is this. Uh, so if the Platonist says there's some property red, and so that's the thing that's causing the set of all red objects to be red objects, that's supposed to be explanatory. It's not clear that it is. Um, and so uh, the nominalist says, no, what you have is a set of similar things. And that similarity is what we were calling redness, the thing that's similar about all those things. But that's where the concept comes from. It comes from the similarity among all those things. And of course, the goal then is to only be referring to physical things. 
uh, in nominalism. Let me put a cough drop here. Uh, so, so on numbers, for example, well, you've got various sets of things. You know, you've got the whole set and you've got sets around how many horses, how many spoons, how many houses, yeah, and so on. So uh, there are various sizes of sets. So what numbers are, are names of different sets. Sets like that, we call three. Sets like that, we call 27, and so on. Uh, that's, that's roughly the idea. What we care about today, because we're thinking about metaphysics here, is the claim is that really what exists are these material things, these physical objects. And they are sets of physical objects, but they are physical objects. And if everything can be shown to be a, a reference to a set of physical objects of some kind, well, then materialism sort of, you know, goes through. You know, Platonism, everything has uh, its price. For uh, To be a Platonist, you have to buy into the existence of all these uh, all these universals and non-physical objects. It's a very promiscuous kind of metaphysics. Um, and so, uh, but then the Platonists can say something like this, second bullet point. You can be a presentist in the metaphysics of time. We have a metaphysics of time video in this series, of course. Um, that is, you can say only the present moment exists. Well, what about all the possibilities and things, things, the way things could have been? What about all the possibilities about what's going to happen next? The rather odd, I find, not clear view of the Platonist is that these things, possibilities, things like uh, states of affairs, states of affairs is a philosophical term of art, meaning ways the world could be. It could have been that the lamp was over there, uh, but there could be, of course, other very much larger differences in the in the state of affairs that obtains. Again, you say that they're, the state of affairs obtains. So, um, uh, and so you have Platonists are presentists. They say that uh, objects are wholly and fully present in the present moment and only the present moment exists. And they are then similarly actualists about the world. They say that the only the actual world exists. Only this world is what exists. Okay, and then again, the, all the rest of the work is done by these Platonic entities in a somewhat mysterious way, but that's roughly the, the Platonist position. Of course, God does the work, right? The Platonists are the God people, as you probably know by now. So the materialist metaphysics of nominalism, again, to understand why nominalism, what it is, it seems like some sort of very abstruse analytical claim that everything is names of things or something, but no, it's a very down to earth claim that is uh, nominalism is the claim that abstract terms are really refer ultimately are referring to sets of physical things because the only thing that exists is physical things. So nominalism is a vehicle for materialism, a kind of materialism. Um, these arguments go back and forth. Um, you know, as I say, what my project here is to try and make some uh, metaphysics accessible to you if you're, you know, haven't been studying this before. So, for example, I think Plato sort of gets the better of Aristotle on this because Aristotle wants to say the only place you ever find form is in matter, just as the only place you ever find matter is in form. But the Platonists can say things like, well, what about, you know, you've got all the, the, the numbers, right? 1,012, 1,326, and so on. So, um, in order to say that those numbers exist, Played, uh, Aristotle looks like he'd have to say that somewhere in the universe there is, in fact, a physical figure that's got uh, 1,027 sides and so on. Or think more about random shapes, like shapes you might doodle. What about all those random shapes? Do they, uh, do they all um, only exist because they exist in the real world, it, in, in physical matter? It seems that they don't. What about all the thoughts that no one has thought, all the... Um, statements that no one has made and so on. So again, these are interesting arguments. Uh, second bullet point, nominalists hold that time is a dimension like space and entities because time is a dimension. So it's full of the physical things like space is full of physical things, right? Actually, a lot of people think of time as a dimension but when you start to think of time as a dimension it's got its pros and cons but the nominalist wants to say the time is a dimension. Um, uh, and that, um, 
So for example, objects in time. Again, remember the Platonist is a presentist. The, the Platonist says objects are in the present moment. Only the present moment exists. So everything is wholly and fully present in this moment. And, and the past and the future don't exist. The present moment is what exists. Uh, the nominalist says, no, I am spread out across time the same way I'm spread out across space. My hand is spread out across space. Space is a dimension, right? My hand is spread out across space. And uh, so if I also, if time is a dimension, then I must be spread out across time that way as well. And the way you could put that is to say I'm a space-time worm. Think of a sort of God's eye view of the universe where you don't have any time. And then it would look sort of like a spaghetti world, right? Everything would be very long from its beginning to its end temporally. So it's like the, uh, the blind man on the elephant, right? There are time slices of me, just like there are physical slices of me. Um, all right. Um, so last bullet point then following through on this approach that nominalists have, this materialist approach to these issues and modality nominalists offer the same program. Um, however, as I say there in the third bullet point, in offering that program, they really do manage to come up with some uh, metaphysical philosophy that's really very strange sounding. I mean, you would think that the materialists would be the ones who would be most congenial to ordinary persons of common sense. But actually what we find in this discussion of uh, the metaphysics of possible worlds, modal logic is materialist philosophers getting themselves in some real strange positions, which is one of the things that's interesting and diverting about this topic. So a big thing that's going on here is with computation. Of course, we come into the age of computation in the 20th century, that's building in the late 19th century with this very important seminal work by uh, logicians and philosophers of mathematics like, uh, uh, like Frege and Cantor and Russell and people like that. See, the thing is, the computer is very literal. As you know, the computer does exactly what it's told. And it's not a speculative beastie. Specifically, the computers compute are what programmers call the ontology of the program. You can actually see in job notices for programmers that they'll be looking for an ontologist at times. What, what is that? It's not physics, it's not uh, ph philosophers doing ontology, it's computer programmers doing ontology. What does it mean? The, the computer is programming over the entities that you have specified. Okay, and to a computer, as I say there in the first bullet point, an X is an X. Getting computers to see uh, the modal status of individual entities in its ontology seemed really pretty much impossible until the development of possible worlds modal logic. Um, okay, so second bullet point, in possible worlds modal logic, computations done over sets of possible worlds. And so uh, if you say, well, I could have been a train conductor, or I could have been a humanities teacher, that is, there's a possible world where I'm a train conductor, and there's a possible world where I'm a humanities teacher. And both of those possible worlds for the computer have exactly the same ontological status. They're just equally real. And that's how you sort of fool the computer into doing modal logic uh, because, the, because nominalists have a program of showing that everything that's being referred to is really referring ultimately to physical objects organized in sets of possible worlds. So then uh, that last bullet point on the slide here is maybe the most one of the most important points during this whole presentation, because this is just sort of the schematic of how possible worlds modal logic works. When we say something's necessary, according to this, uh, we're saying that it's true in all possible worlds. When we say it's contingent, we're saying it's false in some possible world. If we say it's possible that this is true, what we're saying is, or this could happen, we're saying this is true in some possible world and impossible is false in all possible worlds probability referring to the relative sizes of sets of possible worlds. Um, the, the set of possible worlds, so I mean, if it's any consolation to you, for example, the set of possible worlds where Hillary Clinton was elected president of the United States in 2016 
is way larger, as far as I can see, than the set of possible worlds where Donald Trump was elected in 2016. That looks a little fluky, but when we say it's a little fluky, what the possible worlds modal logician says is that as far as you can see, the set of possible worlds where he's the president is actually smaller than the set of possible worlds where she was the president, if it's any consolation. <laughs> Unfortunately, you get the actual world that you get. Okay, so in a nutshell, right, that's uh, possible worlds modal logic. That's how it works. That is, you get the computer to compute over sets of possible worlds, and that way the computer can deal with some one thing being necessary, just means it's true in all possible worlds, something else being possible, it's true in some possible world, and so on. That's how it works. But this um, innovation in modal logic, and this is the way, I mean, you know, modal logic is like third, you know, third year logic, and this is the way that it's done, raises some very interesting philosophical questions. And it puts philosophy in a difficult spot. Uh, because, and notice also, you know, you can say, well, the, people will, will often try with philosophy to say, well, this will be something that science will answer someday. And uh, people will even take that into ethical philosophy in other areas, but it's uh, usually not true. I mean, there's usually a reason why philosophers are still talking about something. So, for example, uh, uh, why does something exist rather than nothing? Isn't it true that there just could have been nothing? And that's not the kind of question that a material science scientist uh, addresses. In fact, in recent years, we had a bit of a kerfluffle because some physicists were trying to um, claim that they were talking about how something came from nothing, for example. But then it turned out that uh, they were always referring to something. It doesn't matter what the something is. It, it could be something like uh, quantum fluctuations in the void that most people, including me, don't really know what that's even supposed to mean. But it's something, not nothing. Okay. And the reason that physicists can't address the modal questions like that is because, after all, what physical science is, by definition, is just looking at the physical relationship between physical things. Simple as that. So, how do we do it? As I say, second bullet point. And remember, we could not do all this computation you have in your smartphones and all over the place. None of that is possible without um, uh, possible worlds modal, modal, uh, modal logic. So you might think this is fairly outside stuff, kind of hippie stuff, but it's very important hippie stuff, okay? <laughs> um, so the one thing that can fool people is you get platonic realists are people who believe in the existence of non-physical transcendental platonic things, whereas modal realists believe in the existence of all possible worlds. But modal realists then are, are a funky, very funky version of materialists. The reason they want to say that all possible worlds exist is because those are all possible concrete physical worlds. And what you want is that only concrete physical things exist. So that's what you get. If you say, just give it to me that all possible worlds exist, then I can very persuasively become a metaphysical materialist. Um, David Lewis, last bullet point, the most, prominent, the most prominent contemporary defender of modal realism. I think it's fair to say that a great deal of this discussion is really motivated by him. Uh, gives us a strong world, a strong argument. He says, look, you want to know what a possible world is like? Well, look around, because after all, this world is... This is the actual world, so obviously it's a possible world. So we do have an example of what a possible world looks like. It looks like this. And, you know, other possible worlds are going to be like this one, so far as we know. And he also pointed out that when you, for the actualist, remember, it says only the actual world exists. Uh, it's like saying only here exists. Here is indexical. There is indexical. What's an indexical word? A word that gets its meaning from its context. For me, here, across the street is over there. For the people across the street, that's here, and over here is over there. <laughs> I'm me and you're you, except for you, you're me and I'm you. <laughs> See what I mean? So uh, so actual, the word actual gets you nothing, but it's obviously just an indexical word. An interesting aspect of this whole discussion is how it relates to personal identity. Personal identity, that is, what's the metaphysics of me? Am I my mind? Am I my body? Uh, what is it that is really the metaphysical me? Again, remember, according to nominalism, I'm a space-time worm. That is, I'm time slices. And so 
um, possible worlds modal logic says the same thing about possible worlds on the set of all possible me's, right? Um, so think of a tree diagram with uh, lots of forking paths, just your basic tree diagram. According to the actualist, and of course, this also is what uh, most common sense people assume, the real me is the one who followed that specific path of contingencies, the one that followed, that went this way at that fork, that way at that fork, the paths that I actually took, unfortunately. Um, the modal realist, though, remember the modal realist says, uh, remember the, the, the nominalist says, well, you're spread out over time. There are time slices of you. Right? You're not wholly present here. You're present in other times as well. That's you. That's as much you back in 1981 or whatever as it is now. The modal realist's version of the same claim is that, well, I'm not just this uh, being who followed this particular path of contingencies. I'm actually this whole tree, the whole section of sort of the great forking tree that just is the universe that includes me, you know, and I'm spread out over that the same way I'm spread out over space. Remember, originally I'm spread out over space. My body occupies different points in space. So, okay, then if time's a dimension, then I'm spread out over time. I occupy different points in time. But then if potentiality is a, uh, a dimension, then I'm spread out over all those potentials, all, all those ways that I could have been. Lewis curiously drops this. Uh, I think he, I don't understand why he does it, although uh, I could do more work excavating his specific arguments for that. But he says, well, you have counterparts in possible worlds, which very much defeats the purpose. It's kind of taking it all back as a third bullet point. Because after all, uh, in order to get materialism, it has to be that I exist in all the possible worlds that include me. Right? It has to be uh, that that um, that's the uh, that's the anomalous account of my modal status, right? uh, and that's not done if it turns out that I only exist in this world. If I only exist in this world, then there are no uh, then I have no modality at all. I have modality when I'm considered to be a being who spread out across all the possible worlds, across all the states of affairs. You know, so that's that's the point. So. So it's odd that Lewis does that, uh, but there it is, you know, this is literature. So here we go, common sense actualism on the left there. I have followed all of these forks. I've gone this way, I've gone that way. That's my path. Modal realism again saying what I really am is uh, spread out, what it spread out across the possibility space, just as I'm spread out across space and time. Another thing, uh, in addition to, for example, the discussion of personal identity that's interesting, you also get a kind of uh, an attempt at a modal ontological proof of gods from these earnest um, young men at Notre Dame. <laughs> um, and so here's, here's the idea. They're trying to please Professor Bluntinga, I guess. It's been proposed that uh, Possible World's modal logic offers a new improved version of traditional ontological proof of the existence of God. That argument is a logical one. The ontological proof is one of the medieval proofs of the existence of God. The other two are the cosmological and the teleological proofs, but we're not talking about them today. Um, and on that argument, we can conceive of a being, this is a very crude version of the argument because obviously I'm going uh, very quickly here and trying to give you a basic introduction. So the argument roughly is that I can conceive of a being uh, that is greater, uh, greater than, uh, being greater than which does not exist. Uh, and then the next step is to say, but obviously a being it's, right, uh, that exists is, is greater than a being that does not exist. So the, the being that's greater than any being that can be conceived is, uh, among other attributes it must have, is that it exists. Um, I noticed, I mentioned a parenthesis there in the first bullet point. We can't actually conceive of being a, a greater being than which can, does not exist. We can mention such a thing, and there's a difference between mention and use, and, and and mentioning something and actually conceiving of such a thing. Conceiving of such a thing is sort of forming some kind of idea of a thing. Uh, 
we're not doing that. We're just chopping logic. If we say, well, there's has to be a thing that's greater than anything else, whatever that even means. So second bullet point, it's a really bad argument in the first point, in the first, uh, in, the, uh, in the first point. Um, and the, and the possible world's modal argument has all the arguments, uh, has all the problems that the original one does. So if you understand the problems of the original one, you can easily see how, for example, you can prove that anything exists using this, this version of um, the ontological proof. Uh, so I'm not gonna go over those, but I do wanna offer uh, maybe some uh, more original thoughts in the last bullet point, where I'll give you three reasons why the, mo the modal ontological proof doesn't exist. Again, the, the way the proof goes is, well, um, there's, a, there's a possible world in which there exists a being, a being greater than which cannot be conceived. And that, and there is a possible world in which that being exists necessarily to say it exists necessarily is to say it exists in all possible worlds. Since there is a possible world where there is a being that necessarily exists in all possible worlds, then necessarily that being exists in this world, which is one of the possible worlds. Okay, that's the way that the argument goes. So third bullet point. First of all, you have to show, you would have to show that God's possible. I don't see that part of the argument. Say that God is possible is to say that God exists in some possible world. So before you can say that there's a possible world where God exists necessarily, you have to, you have to show us that there's a possible world where God exists. And that's missing. Um, second, the argument notice is trying to piggyback on modal realism, but, modal realism, but remember that modal realism is a kind of materialism that denies the existence of transcendental entities like God. And modal realism, in fact, claims that what we can do uh, with possible worlds modal logic is translate or analyze these abstract claims into uh, claims about sets of physical objects. So presumably that's going to be true in the case of God as well. At least that's going to be the, the program of the position. So I'm not sure that it can be uh, turned around to be used in the opposite direction. And third, if I can think of a possible world where God exists uh, necessarily, I can also think of a possible world where God is impossible. And to say that God is impossible is to say that God exists in no possible worlds. So it looks like it's just as valid for me to say that uh, there's a possible world out there where God is impossible as it is for me to say there's a possible world out there where God is necessary. It's only because everybody, all the God people, just assume that God's necessary in the first place. They don't notice how sloppy that is. But, you know, uh, according to the possible world's ontological proof here, I can use it this way. I can say, well, there's a possible world where God is impossible. And that means it exists in no possible worlds. So that then God doesn't exist in this possible world. Why not? But it's an interesting argument uh, and another part of this sort of uh, literature about possible worlds. It's an odd situation. Why is it an odd situation? Well, um, you know, metaphysics is kind of a hard thing to do. I mean, I'm just this guy. I don't know about the fundamental nature of the universe, you know, so how can I even approach doing something like metaphysics? Kant, you know, very pretty clear on this, you can't, but sure. Um, Look at the connection between metaphysics and semantics. That is, I can say we have these concepts, some of them are abstract, and I can look at the or analyze, it's not that doesn't mean anything too technical. I can look at those concepts and see how they're used. And I can question how they're used. Yeah, and that way I can start to make claims about what sorts of things exist and what sorts of things don't. What sort of claim is it? Maybe it's a semantic claim. Um, but I would identify metaphysics with semantics that way. I find that useful also, again, because people think that metaphysics is just some far out thing that no one can do, but we can certainly think about uh, what we're referring to when we use our abstract concepts. So, so, and it can be useful. So think about the concept of soul also. They say, well, define God, then what does that do? It gets you thinking about God, doesn't it? And it gets you thinking about it in a way that's getting you somewhere new, right? Because it looks like it's hard to define God. So really just start thinking about the concept of soul and you'll get into some interesting thought spaces that way. So that's what it is. And so what we do then, fourth bullet point and the point of this slide is that 
you know, we, we look at these things and we, and we ask ourselves, what are the commitments of our language? What are the things that we refer to? For example, with ethics, somebody might say that, look, somebody might say there's no such thing as ethics, but uh, after all, I mean, I get up in the morning and I spend my day thinking about sort of what's right and wrong, or trying to convince other people, other people convince me, I change my mind, I feel sorry, I think other people should be sorry and so on. So, you know, I don't know what someone means when they say there's no such thing as ethics. Uh, you know, there most certainly is. <laughs> and so, uh, so last one, here's the thing. The way we do modal logical computing today involves reference to possible worlds. That implies some ontological commitment. And it just does. I mean, it's not unreasonable, you say, because, because when I say the way that we do modal logical computing today, I mean, that is to say, that modal logic is done on the model of computing over sets of possible worlds. That's what we say that we're doing. And that strongly implies that we believe that those possible worlds exist, even though on a common sense level, we'll say, well, we don't. But uh, philosophically speaking, it is a really interesting situation, uh, a real issue, because it looks like right now, the way that we talk, certainly the way that we do logic is one that commits us to the existence of these possible worlds. Finally, uh, here are the two main uh, antagonists in this discussion. This is David Lewis and Alvin Plantinga. And here comes the dog. Um, David Lewis, the most prominent exponent of modal realism, and his antagonist is Alvin Plantinga, who exposes, who espouses Platonist views and who is a theist. Uh, Lewis's main statement is on the plurality of worlds. Also, let me just actually, I haven't stepped out at all. Let me just step out of this for a second, tell you a little story, uh, a modal story. It's a modality story. Many years ago, my mother and father were living in Tampa, Florida. So a long time ago. And I was out in some little strip mall by the highway of which there are zillions in Tampa, if you know that area. And they had this little shelf, a little two shelves with little, you know, little sort of non books, you know, thought of the day and maybe a little Christian apologetics book and just those kind of little sort of funky little books that a, that a stationary store would have. And on the shelf was David Lewis's on the plurality of worlds. They had a copy of David Lewis's on the plurality of worlds in this little stationary store uh, in Tampa. New, I mean, for sale with the other books. And I noticed it and I thought, oh, oh gosh, look at that. And then I, I went away and I went back to Colorado. I was in graduate school at the University of Colorado Boulder. And a while later, I was interested in, you know, more interested in David Lewis and, and in this issue. And I thought of that book and it had been like a year or two since I'd seen it there. And I called my mother in Tampa and I said, mom, could you go out to that little strip mall out on the highway and look at this, their little shelf where they have their little books and see if they have David Lewis's plurality of worlds? And she went out there and they, and she did, and she bought it and she sent it to me. And that was at least 20 years, at least 20 years ago. And just right over in the other room there outside of the casino here, I've got it. That's, that's my copy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, um, okay. Share the screen. Okay. Uh, whoopsie. No, I gotta go back. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so on the plurality of worlds, uh, note a second bullet point, by the way, just while we're at it, when we talk about possible worlds or the plurality of worlds, this is nothing to do with multiverse theories or physics at all. These are logical arguments. These possible worlds don't have any connection or relationship to each other in time or space or causally. They're logical objects. They're not physical objects. Plantinga's views, meanwhile, essays in the metaphysics of modality, he got a lot of attention with warranted Christian belief in the year 2000. I think he's written a shorter uh, version of that since then. Both Lewis and Plantinga are really funny, really witty people. I recommend them to your company. One time I, I, I tend in class sometimes to email the professors that we're reading just to, if we have a question to students like that. I emailed Plantinga when I was interested in fatalism. I said, are you a fatalist? Just email them, are you a fatalist? And about a day later, I get it back. No, because I asked him, are you a fatalist? And he said, no. <laughs> so, um, 
So this is um, a, a difficult, but I think very interesting and also diverting. It's both uh, fun as hard philosophy, but it's also kind of outlandish. So uh, the metaphysics of uh, possible worlds modal logic, metaphysics of modality. And I hope that in this short discussion that we had of that today, that maybe I've helped to illuminate that a little bit by tying it into some other things and keeping things really basic. I hope I have. And, um, and so I shall um, see you later. If the creeks don't rise. <laughs>